HDMI 2.1 is not future-proofed in 2020. Simply put, there isn't a company in history that will ever give you a free pass on all their future products. If you don't believe me, ask yourself this. How many times have you upgraded your TV, sound system, phones, computers, and the list goes on with electronics that you've had to purchase as years have gone on? They've sold you on so many awesome features at the time to make you want to buy those products, but here you are upgrading each time something more impressive comes along. Simply put, as technology evol evolves, you're going to have to upgrade. Now, HDMI 2.1 in 2020 is a bit of a moot point. The reason for that is because they sell a lot of features, but some of them aren't really necessary. And honestly, you can get by with the technology we have today, especially when we're talking about TVs. For example, dynamic metadata. You don't need that right now for HDR. Why is that? Because there's no industry standard. When we say SDR, you know what we're talking about. But when we say HDR, you have no idea what we're talking about. Is it Dolby Vision? Is it HDR10 Plus? Maybe HLG? Maybe HDR10? It's all over the place. And honestly speaking, it's a bit of a beta test, a giant beta test, if I'm going to be very honest with you. Because one metadata might look different from the next in how they do their dynamic metadata. You're talking from HDR10 to HDR10 Plus with Dolby Vision going upwards to 12 bit color. But oh, spoiler alert, we don't have that either. So needless to say, HDR is really a pipe dream at this point. I mean, seriously, I've noticed some serious brightness, brightness fluctuations when we get to Dolby Vision content, just simply because it tries to adapt the brightness on a scene by scene basis, but it doesn't always look great or work out in the ideal way. So HDR 10 usually is brighter and more colorful, defeating the whole purpose of Dolby Vision. Simply put, the technology hasn't evolved to the actual Dolby Vision standard, and we're still operating on something called Dolby Vision Enabled, which is you have support for it, but it's not fully supported for the full standard, which is kind of a reoccurring theme I see with these technologies. They tout them around as being the greatest and the best, but in reality, that's not what ends up happening. So until HDR has one singularity, one single approach to making HDR content, don't use it. I mean, honestly, just stick with SDR. It's really good. And nine times out of 10, better than HDR. That's not to say all HDR is garbage and you can't get any kind of good benefit from it. But most cases and scenario, that's kind of how it plays out. Now, when we talk about the next benefits that they talk about, they talk about enhanced audio return channels or eARC, which is great. You experience lossless, uncompressed files with Dolby Atmos, which is fantastic. Problem being, if you have a fantastic Dolby Atmos display right now, you do not need this and you're probably not going to upgrade as it's just not necessary. So you can scratch that off the list because Dolby Atmos sounds pretty darn good without it being lossless already. So then you look at the next thing that they try to sell you on, which is the auto low latency mode or ALLM. There are people that really get this one confused. They genuinely think auto low latency means that you're getting a more responsive image. That's not what it means. Auto low latency mode means that it's putting you in the lowest latency mode of your television, which is, spoiler alert, game mode. It just switches to game mode automatically, which is something you can do yourself. Not really necessary. Now, to be very clear, HDMI 2.1 does have a benefit of reducing input lag, which is often confused with ALLM, and that is called quick frame transport. Quick frame transport allows the television and the console or source box to speak to each other a lot faster, reducing the delay or the lag between communications. What this means for you is that when you're playing your PS5 or Xbox Series X, that information goes to the screen far faster than it ever did before, resulting in far more responsive input lag. So that is a genuine benefit of HDMI 2.1. Now you're talking about media switching. Media switching is going to be another benefit of HDMI 2.1, and that is going to be where when you go from your Nintendo Switch to your PlayStation 5 to your Blu-ray player, that black frame that would pause in between that you're waiting, you don't have that anymore, which is great, but not necessarily needed because it didn't really take all that long. It's just a momentary lapse, and it's not something that really destroys the experience for most people. Simply put, at every turn you look at it, you're being sold features that are either redundant, under-optimized, or really not necessary. And that leads me to my next one, Variable Refresh Rate, or VRR. This is quite unarguably the most confused topic right now with the HDMI 2.1 umbrella. 
Simply put, HDMI 2.1 is a great thing for future technologies that will be developed, no doubt. But in 2020, we don't have a whole lot of stuff taking advantage of 8K at 120 hertz. So that's a pretty useless benefit right there because, I mean, people are trying to sell you on these things, right? Enlarge variable refresh rate is adaptive sync technology for those who are new to this. Adaptive sync technology has been around for years on PC through the forms of vSync. And all the idea here is you're not getting frame tearing, you're not getting judders and stutters. But to do that on PC, you had to trade off your input lag or responsiveness, or you had to trade off your smoothness for micro stutters, depending on which variation of vSync you take on, whether it's vSync, vSync fast, vSync half the frame rate. Really, there are so many different ways you can set it up. Though, once you get into PC, things get more complex. You can talk about your triple buffers and things like that, but that's neither here nor now. When we're talking about variable refresh rate as it pertains to the next generation consoles, we're talking about AMD technology, exclusively AMD technology, because they're built with AMD GPUs and CPUs. And this is a big thing to notice because the whole idea between AMD and G-Sync and what makes them so different is because one's proprietary, one's not. G-Sync to be a G-Sync display, you have to have a G-Sync modular device, or I'm sorry, a G-Sync module inside of the display. If you don't have a G-Sync module inside of the actual display, it is not a G-Sync device. We can see that the only TV on the market right now that is actually a G-Sync display is the big gaming or the big format gaming display from NVIDIA. Now, Outside of that, you have G-Sync compatible devices, and these have been validated by NVIDIA as, yes, this is a good experience. You don't have any flickering, any black frames, any dropouts. It's great. Good to go. So that's good, but it's not fully optimized either. And what's more is that you have non-validated displays that can work even though they haven't been validated through NVIDIA. So the process is very convoluted. As you guys saw last night, I uploaded a video where I showed my Samsung Q8FN getting non-validated G-Sync support because it is definitely a thing. Now, when we talk about AMD FreeSync, it's open source. It's easy for anybody to grab, but this means that manufacturers can put those actual AMD chipsets for FreeSync inside of their television at a lower cost than paying NVIDIA for the proprietary rights to be able to do that. It's very expensive. It's very, you know, not ideal for a manufacturer trying to cut costs anyway with the way TVs have been built lately, if you guys know what I'm saying on that. You know, it, it's just like you kind of shoot yourself in the foot if you're not going with a FreeSync display because you have the chipset in there, you have that actual FreeSync module, and you're going to be getting the best experience because it's fully supported with FreeSync Ultimate or FreeSync Basic, which translates in English to FreeSync 1 and 2 when you see it on those diagrams. Now, of course, there is another form of adaptive sync technology, which is VESA. You have a generic HDMI 2.1 support for it. It's not even like proprietary at all. I mean, there are so many different ways to go about it. But the problem is when you have proprietary technology like AMD, which will be found in Xbox Series X and PS5, you're running into problems where you need to make sure that they are not having any handshaking issues. And this comes down to the optimization of the hardware. And so, as you guys are clearly hearing, this is a huge topic and it's not something that can be solved overnight. In fact, there, as I've been stating to many LG OLED fanboys, there isn't a single AMD GPU right now on the market that works with NVIDIA G-Sync displays. It, there is no G-Sync right now on AMD GPUs. We're still waiting for those drivers to come out. And the reality is the drivers came out only quite recently for NVIDIA to be able to take advantage of FreeSync displays. It's very new what they're doing. And the idea that by the time the next generation consoles come out, you're going to have all this stuff already worked out. You're putting a lot of blind faith in an IOU for something that's relatively new, even for PC gamers. The reality is this is stuff that takes time. And with that, you're, you're setting yourself up for disappointment, man. Honestly speaking, I, I'd never understand the person that would rather buy an LG just for the brand name and buy G-Sync, even though they are buying a FreeSync console when AMD technologies are what you need to be buying. That's a whole argument that I'll have nor neither here or now, but the reality is that's how these things work. Now, I wanna specify this, having generic variable refresh rate through the HDMI 2.1 is not the same as having a FreeSync modular display. 
or rather not modular, a FreeSync module built into the display, an actual chipset for FreeSync in your TV. If you don't have that, that's going to be a big difference in performance. I'm just saying right now. So much so that they need to put asterisks next to the performance of what you're getting. The only LG OLED right now that has full FreeSync support is the LG Z10. That's no coincidence that it's one of their most expensive televisions they make. The whole idea here that people are expecting a lot for nothing needs to stop. You're not going to be getting everything for nothing. And that pertains to console gamers on PS5 and Xbox Series X as well. Expecting that they're going to get 4K, 8K, all at 120 hertz. Not understanding that there are some serious GPU limitations that go along with that. So if you're expecting HDMI 2.1 to deliver 8K, I'll just politely ask you to stop. Now, it's not happening at all. It's, it's just not happening. Let's not even have that conversation. There isn't a single GPU on the planet right now at the consumer level that can hit those metrics. Now, when we're talking about 4K at 120, it's doable, but not on a PS5 for sure with their variable 10 teraflop performance. And it's a little more challenging on the Xbox Series X. In large, most gaming companies will probably target 4K60 because it's pretty much easier to do, less demanding, less expensive, and again, it's just computationally more achievable than what we have right now on the market, so I think that's something that they're going to do, but either way, I'm sure people are going to see with the next generation consoles that when you expect a $500 machine to be a $2,000 or $4,000 gaming rig, you're going to be let down. The reality is, though, HDMI 2.1 is not needed in 2020. You can wait and you can see what they do with it, but ultimately speaking, you can benefit from 4K60 right now with HDMI 2.0. Let's see them develop better technologies, take advantage of industry standards and make industry standards before we start jumping onto something that is still very new, just for the sake of having something new. So in 2020, yeah, you don't need HDMI 2.1. A little bit longer of a video than what I would like to make. There's a lot of information I still haven't covered, We'd be here the latter part of an hour if I did. Uh, this is the 12-minute upstreet version, but either way, yeah, there's the information, my dudes. So I put this out to help you guys. Smack a like because nobody's going to do that and really just go over this to help you out. And just seriously, smack a like for me being that guy that's just having your back and saying, hey, scale the expectations and watch out for the bullshit. Thanks for watching the number one brand in honesty. And until the next video, I'll see you guys later.